The Third Man by Graham Greene, One. One never knows when the blow may fall. When I saw Rollo Martins first, I made this note on him for my security police files. In normal circumstances, a cheerful fool drinks too much and may cause a little trouble. Whenever a woman passes, raises his eyes and makes some comment, but I get the impression that he'd really rather not be bothered. Has never really grown up, and perhaps that accounts for the way he worshipped Lyme. I wrote there that phrase in normal circumstances because I met him first at Harry Lyme's funeral. It was February, and the grave diggers had been forced to use electric drills to open the frozen ground in Vienna's central cemetery. It was as if even nature were doing its best to reject Lyme. But we got him in at last and laid the earth back on him and on him like bricks. He was vaulted in, and Rollo Martins walked quickly away as though his long, gangly legs wanted to break into a run, and the tears of a boy ran down his 35-year-old face. Rollo Martins believed in friendship, and that was why what happened later was a worse shock to him than it would have been to you or me, you because you would have put it down to an illusion, and me because at once a rational explanation, however wrongly, would have come to my mind. If only he had come to tell me then what a lot of trouble would have been saved. If you were to understand this strange, rather sad story, you must at least have an impression at least of the background. The smashed, dreary city of Vienna divided up in zones among the four powers. The Russian, the British, the American, the French zones, regions marked only by notice boards, and in the center of the city, surrounded by the ring with its heavy public buildings and its prancing statuary, the Innerstadt, under the control of all four powers. In this once fashionable inner city, each power in turn for a month at a time takes, as we call it, the chair and becomes responsible for security. At night, if you were fool enough to waste your Austrian shillings in a nightclub, you would be fairly certain to see the international power at work. Four military police, one from each power, communicating with each other if they communicated at all in the common language of their enemy. I never knew Vienna between the wars. I am too young to remember the old Vienna with its Strauss music and its bogus easy charm. To me, it is simply a city of undignified ruins which turned that February into great glaciers of snow and ice. The Danube was a gray, flat, muddy river a long way off across the second berserk. The Russian zone, where the Prater lay smashed and desolate and full of weeds, only the great wheel revolving slowly over the foundations of merry-go-rounds like abandoned millstones and rusting iron of smashed tanks which nobody had cleared away. The frost-nipped weeds where the snow was thin. I haven't enough imagination to picture it as it had once been, any more than I can picture Satcher's Hotel as other than a transit hotel for English officers or to see the Kartnerstrasse as a fashionable shopping street instead of a street which exists, most of it, only at eye level, repaired up to the first story. A Russian soldier in a fur cap goes by with a rifle over his shoulder. A few tarts cluster around the American information office, and old men in overcoats sip ersatz coffee in the windows of the old Vienna. At night, it is just as well to stick to the inner city or the zones of three of the powers. Though even there the kidnappings occur, such senseless kidnappings they sometimes seem to us. A Ukrainian girl without a passport, an old man beyond the age of usefulness, sometimes, of course, the technician or the traitor. This was roughly the Vienna to which Rollo Martin came on February 7th last year. I have reconstructed the affair as best I can from my own files and from what Martin's told me. It is as accurate as I can make it. I have tried not to invent a line of dialogue, though I can't vouch for Martin's memory. An ugly story if you leave out the girl, grim and sad and unrelieved. If it were not for the absurd episode of the British Council Lecturer. And that's the end of the first part.